Having fun? <laughs> Should say yes. Uh, so thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, it's a lot of people. I'm slightly nervous. Uh, so let's talk about a passwordless future. How many of you came here knowing what you're getting? I know, like, or, or expecting something. OK. <laughs> OK, <laughs> not bad. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I'm Deepu. Shashidharan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm part of the J Hipster uh, team, uh, uh, Java champion, yada yada. Uh, into open source, uh, done a lot of open source stuff. Uh, polyglot developer, mainly Java, Rust, Go, TypeScript, and stuff. Uh, work as a developer advocate at Okta. How many of you have, How many of you know Okta? Nice. How many of you know Auth0? Same people. Great. I think we have done some good job of uh, marketing, maybe. <laughs> cool. So uh, first things first, why do we even have to go passwordless, right? We have been using passwords for what, like thousands of years? And uh, it's quite handy, right? We share our Netflix passwords up until recently. It's, it's, it's handy, right? So why do we even have to get rid of that and you know, move into something new? So uh, Verizon publishes uh, a survey. Uh, it's called the uh, Data Breach Investigation Report. And uh, the 2023 survey says that 65% of all cred uh, you know, breaches, like security breaches, involve some sort of credentials. So it could be credential uh, uh, stuffing, uh, social engineering, phishing, all, all kind of credential-related issues. So 65%, that's a, that's a huge number, right? And the uh, year before, it was 70%. So we are, we are doing a good job of reducing it a bit, but still, it's a, it's a huge chunk. And uh, I don't think uh, we as a species are evolved enough to you know, use something like passwords, you know, because it expects us to remember things, not share things, not to reuse stuff, which you know, we have a quadrillion times proven wrong that, that we are not capable of doing these kind of things. We cannot be trusted with these things. We are always the weakling, right, in, in, in anything, most things. Uh, so the technology is not to blame, it's, it's us, mostly on us. So let's see, let's dissect that a bit, right, to understand that a bit. Like, so passwords are knowledge base, right? It's something you know, which means, you know, it's hard to remember. You need complex passwords uh, so that nobody can guess your password. So there is a limit on how many complex passwords you can remember, right? So how many of you can remember, let's say, 10 complex passwords? Wow, one person, two per, three. Wow, okay, five. Not bad, few more. Three. Whoa, okay, less than I expected. Two. Okay, cool, I, I feel very good about myself because I can re remember like three complex passwords. So, <laughs> um, so it's hard, right? It's, it's not easy to remember a lot of passwords. Uh, of course, we tech folks, we use password managers, we, we know how to get around these issues. But think about uh, common folks. How many of them know what a password manager is? How many of them even use something besides what the browser provides? How many of you are password managers for your, someone in your family? Yes, I'm password manager for my parents. Uh, how many of you use like an uh, actual password manager, not a person. <laughs> Great. I'm not going to shame the ones who are not using, but you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, passwords being knowledge-based also have, have more issues, right? It, it makes us prone to social engineering, you know? So people, even like, uh, you know, 14-year-olds can steal a, a, a password from someone by social engineering. It's not that difficult. It's uh, social engineering someone to get passwords is not that difficult. Even the tech-savvy folks uh, uh, fall prey to this often. Uh, then we have uh, phishing, again, because of passwords. Uh, phishing is only possible because of passwords. You get a, 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 a link that looks almost uh, as the actual one. It looks and feels, the website looks and feels like the actual one. You end up uh, you know, giving uh, out your credentials. Again, even the most tech-savvy sometimes would fall for this. Anybody here who have? Fallen for phishing? No shame, no shame in that. And, and anybody who has almost, like, you know, you went to the website, and like, before clicking that submit, you were like, ha huh, ha. Huh. Yeah, it happens, right? It happens. I mean, some, some phishing scams are so uh, intelligently done that it, it, it's, it's impossible to detect, right? 
Another issue with passwords, being passwords, is someone from, let's say, another continent can access your account and you might not even know it. So unless you have a second factor authentication or some sort of uh, uh, secondary security mechanism set up in your account, you wouldn't even know that your access, uh, you know, account was uh, accessed. How many of you know people who have, their, let's say, their Facebook account or something got uh, compromised? Yeah, I know a lot of people, especially people not in tech, who uh, gets their uh, Facebook account hacked, uh, you know, who ends up uh, giving their uh, credentials to some, some phishing scam, and then their you know, Facebook accounts go, or, or Instagram accounts, all these gets hacked, right? Again, this is possible because of remote replay. Uh, another issue with passwords is data breach. Uh, so data breach, uh, so, so for, if you're a hacker, uh, a particular company's uh, database is uh, attractive to you only if they are storing uh, let's say, sensitive information, like passwords, uh, credit card information, and such. So by saving passwords in our database, we are making it more prone to hacking and data breaches. Because there's a huge market for stolen passwords uh, uh, you know, on the uh, uh, internet, right? So data breach is a huge issue. And another, another issue with uh, pass, uh, passwords being password is that we tend to reuse them, because we cannot remember a lot of uh, complex ones. We tend to reuse them, especially folks who don't use password managers tend to reuse a lot of passwords. We end up sharing passwords. Sharing Netflix password is one thing, but imagine sharing uh, something more, uh, 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 you know, like a bank password or something. That's, that's not a good idea, right? Uh, and finally, on the backend side of things, right? For us developers, uh, passwords also introduce a lot of management issues for us, right? Because of passwords, we have to, uh, let's say, we have to create reset flows. We have to create multi-factor authentication flows. We have to consider a lot more security for how we store our data. We have to uh, solve them. We have to encrypt them. We have to do a lot more to save passwords, right? And uh, we have to um, uh, we have to use password managers. Uh, we have, uh, let, let's say, some in some use cases and especially enterprises. You would have to reset your passwords every now and then, right? Who has the, uh, I don't know, okay, that's a, that, that will be hard to judge calling who has the most, who has faced the worst password policy in, in a company, like how, how short is the reset time? Anybody with like less than like a week or something, reset times? No, um, less than a month? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I work for a company where like every month we had to reset the password. Uh, so. Yeah, it's not nice. And did you know that it costs around like $70 to $100 to actually reset a password, the, the overall cost for, of a reset? So there's that as well. Uh, so uh, how, how, does, how does we can solve that? How, how we can solve that, right? So of course, passwordless would be an obvious choice, right? Let's get rid of passwords, right? We, we fix all that issues. But we already have passwordless. Did that fix most of these issues? No, right? Let's see. So we have uh, biometric-based authentication, uh, which is kind of passwordless. Uh, we have magic link. Some websites just send you a link instead of asking you to set a password. Uh, you get uh, one-time passwords instead of your own password. And you have push notification-based authentication. But even though we have all this for many years, the I mean, it may be the incidents related to credentials maybe have maybe went down a bit, but it hasn't gone away, right? We still have most of the issues. And most of the solutions are susceptible to many of the issues that we uh, already saw, like uh, phishing and these kind of things, right? So what is the solution here, right? Uh, and of course, like, I'm, going to, I'm talking about pass keys. You're new coming here, right? So of course, the solution for that, at least in my opinion, uh, passwordless future is what pass keys are first, right? So what are pass keys? Pass keys are a cryptographic key pair which you can use to authenticate yourself on the internet. Uh, so simple as that. It's based on public key uh, cryptography. Uh, how many of you have actually used uh, pass keys? Wow, nice. It's, uh, I can see this because I have been doing this talk uh, for a while, and I ask this question every time, and the number of people who raise their hands, they, they keep increasing. That means the adoption is working well. Um, and. Uh, how many of you actually know what a passkey is? That's nice. So you talk may not be that boring to you. <laughs> cool. So let's uh, uh, dive a bit more deeper. Let's see how exactly this works. What are the underlying uh, technology? So first thing, uh, a small crash course on public key cryptography. So public key cryptography is a pair of mathematically linked keys which can prove that they belong to each other, right? So you can use that for two purposes. 
Number one would be encryption. Uh, if you have a, a pub, someone's public key, you can encrypt a piece of data using that public key and send it to some, uh, uh, the person who that public key belongs to, and only that person can decrypt the data with a private key. So we use uh, public uh, key pairs for encryption. We also use them for uh, authentication, as in uh, digital signatures. So if you have a you know, private public key pair, you can uh, sign a piece of data using your private key, and you can send it to someone. And of course, in a public, uh, uh, private public key pair uh, cryptography, uh, the public key is public, right? You can share it along, you can even put it on the internet or whatever, right? It's public. You have to keep your private key secure. So in this case, you may, maybe you shared your public key widely or with someone, right? So these people who has the public key can verify that the piece of data has been signed by you. And this is how digital signatures work, PDF signatures and all these, this is how it works. And PDF signatures are more trustworthy than your actual signature because it uses uh, cryptography and they are very hard to uh, imitate. And the next piece of the puzzle is an authenticator. How many of you know what an authenticator is? Nice. So an authenticator is a hardware or software which can create and store uh, public uh, key pairs. So we have two types of uh, authenticators. We have something called platform authenticators. So these are devices that are built into uh, your laptop or your uh, 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 smartphone or something like that. They cannot be removed, so they are part of that particular platform. So examples, Touch ID, Face ID, Windows Hello, um, your smartphones. Uh, we have another type of authenticators. Uh, they are called roaming authenticators. Right? So as the name suggests, they are removable. They, they don't belong to the specific platform. They are removable, and you can connect them using USB, Bluetooth, NFC. Uh, examples, YubiKey. How many of you have a YubiKey? Nice. Um, there are others as well. You can also use your smartphone as a roaming authenticator. That is also an option. So the next piece of the puzzle is FIDO. So FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. It's a, a, a global security standard uh, from uh, a global alliance uh, made up of uh, security professionals, uh, these security companies, and most other major corporations. Uh, it's called, uh, uh, sorry, the, it's called FIDO Alliance. So FIDO Alliance uh, has this goal that they want to make the internet safe and they want to move away from passwords to use uh, public key cryptography based authentication. So that's the goal of FIDO. Uh, so there are uh, standards, uh, of course. Uh, FIDO 2 is the standard that is currently being used for pass keys and web authentication and all these things. It consists of uh, two uh, other standards, the web authentication or the web authentication standard, which is a W3C standard, and then there is another uh, standard called client authenticator protocol. So let's uh, dive a bit more deeper, right? So web authentication uh, is a standard that allows uh, for a passkey implementation. So it gives you a set of uh, JavaScript uh, methods, an API, uh, which you can use to communicate with authenticators. So it has uh, three parts or three uh, pieces in its architecture. So the authenticator, as we saw, uh, can be roaming a platform, doesn't matter. The authenticator is responsible for uh, you know, creating key pairs, saving the private key, uh, saving some metadata, and all these things. Right? Uh, then we have something called a relaying party, which is nothing but a server that requires authentication. So it can be your own server, or if you are using OAuth 2 with an identity provider, it, it will be your identity provider. So that's the relaying party. So the relaying party in this uh, uh, web authentication uh, ceremony is responsible for saving uh, you know, public keys, uh, usernames, and whatever other metadata it, it, it needs. Then we have the client, which is made up of the browser and, of course, the user. So the client, uh, especially the browser, is responsible for orchestrating everything between the authenticator and the relaying party. So it expects the user to be present physically for consent. So that's why the user is there. So user, uh, for pass keys especially, user interaction is all, uh, almost always required. You can, uh, you know, uh, no, it is almost always required. But in some other web authentication ceremonies, it is optional. So that's why the dotted lines. Uh, the next one is uh, client to authenticator protocol. So it's a FIDO standard. Uh, so it's used for communication uh, uh, with roaming authenticators, specifically over USB, NFC, and Bluetooth. 
So it has, of course, the client platform. So if you are using a platform authenticator, the client platform will use the operating system's platform authentication API to talk to the platform authenticators. So every platform provides its own API. Apple provides its own. Android provides its own. Windows, they all provide its own APIs. So they use that for platform authenticator. But for uh, roaming authenticators like YubiKey and stuff, you need something else. So they, it use, the browser will use CTAP2 specifically to talk to roaming authenticators over NFC, Bluetooth, and USB. Bluetooth, I'll, I'll come to that later. Why Bluetooth? Because some of you might be thinking, hey, Bluetooth, it's not that secure, right? I'll come to that. So, which means, so these are all the underlying technologies, right? So, pass keys, based on all this, is nothing but discoverable passwordless FIDO credentials. It's a lot to say. That, that's why pass keys, right? It's easier to say. Uh, so, they are discoverable as in the browsers can discover these credentials. They are, say, they are client side. Uh, your, a relaying party or the server doesn't know about uh, these credentials except for the public keys that they save. So it is mostly managed client side. Uh, there are two types of pass keys. So we have sync pass keys and hardware bound or device bound pass keys. So sync pass keys are what is meant for the masses. And uh, I think this will be the one that will be adopted by most people because it is. Uh, easier to use. The private key gets uh, synced between your devices in the same ecosystem. For example, if you're using sync pass keys on an Apple ecosystem, let's say on a MacBook, you create a pass key and Apple automatically uh, you know, end to end encrypts that uh, uh, the private key created and it stores, in, uh, stores it in the iCloud keychain you know, uh, so that it can be synced back to any other device that you use in that particular, uh, 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 with that particular account. So you, when, the, when you sign into your uh, iPhone the next time, the private key that you created in your MacBook automatically gets synced to the I, uh, iPhone's uh, uh, TPM, the, uh, I think Apple calls it Apple uh, Enclave. It gets synced, uh, so you have it there. You don't have to enroll again or anything. So usability-wise, sync pass keys have way better usability. That's why this will be the one that will be adopted by the masses. It's seamless needs only one-time enrollment, uh, and if you lose your devices, you can get the uh, private keys back because it is in your iCloud. Same with uh, Google. So if you're using Google Chrome, Google also does the same. It, uh, it saves these pass keys in the Google uh, Password Manager, and uh, it will get synced to all the uh, uh, Chrome uh, browsers that you have in whatever devices. Uh, it will get synced to Android. Uh, the same with the password managers. Uh, I think most password managers support pass keys now, so they, are, they can also do this syncing. If you don't want to use uh, you know, Apple or Google, you can use your password manager also for the syncing facility, uh, which means you will get uh, free uh, backups for your keys. You will, you will get free restores. Uh, downside being, it is slightly less secure because theoretically, your private keys are being synced to a cloud. So even though they are end-to-end -end encrypted with, let's say, your um, uh, iCloud password or whatever, theoretically can be breached, so it is slightly less secure. The next uh, variant that we have is uh, device-bound passkeys, right? So the difference is, in a device-bound passkey, the private key is stored on that device. And uh, an example is uh, when you use something like YubiKey. So YubiKeys, it creates uh, these mathematically linked key pairs, and it stores the private key on that particular device, which means there is also like a size restriction. For example, current UB keys, you can store up to 25 pass keys. That's the memory uh, capacity it has. Uh, which means it is not as convenient as sync pass keys because you have to carry around your uh, you know, UB key or something, and you have to enroll for every service. Uh, uh, and if you have multiple UB keys, you have to enroll each one of them. There is no backup features. If you lose your UB keys, your uh, uh, you know, pass key is gone. There's no backup, there is no uh, uh, recovery. But it is the golden standard of security, currently. Currently considered the golden standard of security because it relies on something you have. I'll, I'll come to that later. So these are the two types of pass keys that we have. Um, for example, I'm on, uh, so I'm on Linux, uh, which means I don't have platform authenticators. I know, I know, before you, you are thinking, yeah, Linux, right? No, it's not Linux fault. It's the browsers, which doesn't support it on Linux. Uh, so I, I, you know, I have two options. I can either use uh, device-bound pass keys with a UB key, or I can use my uh, Android mobile phone uh, as my for pass keys, which will do sync pass keys for me, which can communicate, uh, which can communicate with my laptop using uh, client-to-authenticator protocol to ensure that when I am using my phone, 
my devices are close, uh, you know, nearby using Bluetooth. That is why Bluetooth is, is being used. There's no data transfer via Bluetooth. It just uses the Bluetooth signals to make sure the devices are in proximity. Because if it is within 100 meters, you, 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 know, you, you know. If it is not there, then it, it won't let you use that device. So uh, that's how I would use uh, Sync Passkey if you don't have platform authenticator support. So let's see uh, how exactly the entire flow works, right? So pass keys have two flows. So there is a registration ceremony or registration flow, and there is the authentication flow, right? So the registration flow, uh, both flows look a little bit similar, but the registration flow, let's see that. It starts with the client, uh, especially the user, going to a website. Let's say you go to a website called uh, coolsite.com, right? Uh, you have a register button, you click on the register button, you need a challenge. So you request your server or the relaying party for a challenge, which uh, in, in, in theory is a random piece of data, but in practice mostly like a you know, byte 64 string. So you get a random uh, challenge back. Uh, your client side triggers navigators uh, credentials.create uh, method, which is part of the web authentication API. The user have to provide approval, either using a platform authenticator or using a device-bound authenticator. Once uh, user consent is received, the authenticator creates a new uh, public uh, key pair. Uh, it saves the private key on that particular device. So if it was a platform authenticator, let's say if you used uh, uh, Apple's uh, Touch ID on a MacBook, the private key gets stored to the Apple Enclave's uh, TPM, whatever chip they have, it, it gets stored there. If you use a YubiKey, it gets stored on that particular YubiKey. And in case of sync passkey, there is an additional step that your uh, private key gets synced to your whichever uh, provider, like uh, iCloud or you know, Google's password manager or your uh, password manager like Bitwarden, LastPass or whatever, it gets synced there. Uh, the next step, so that, that step is only for sync passkeys. For device bound, there is no syncing, right? The next step is uh, the authenticator creates an attestation response, which, con uh, which contains the public key, uh, a credential ID, and it passes that back to your client-side implementation, which is your like, JavaScript implementation. Then your client uh, passes that back to your relaying party or the server. So the, the server will verify the payload. It will verify that the, uh, it, it has the same challenge that it, it issued. Uh, it will verify that, uh, you know, um, uh, like whatever, like whatever validations you need to do with the user IDs and stuff, it will do that. It will verify that the entire attestation payload is valid, uh, the checksum is valid, and all these things. Then it will save the public key in the database. Here you don't have to do anything extra. You don't have to encrypt the public key. You don't have to do any additional security measures saving public key because it's a public key. Even if someone stole the public key, there's nothing they can do with that. So then comes the authentication. So that, that was registration, right? So that when, when the entire ceremony happens, you are registered. In the authentication flow, which looks very similar, so the user begins uh, the authentication. You go to the website, you click on the login button. Again, you need a challenge here. So you ask the, uh, the client, ask the server or laying party for a challenge. It gets a random uh, string challenge. Then the client triggers the credential.get method, which is the second method in the web authentication API. Uh, so it, of course, it passes the challenge to the method and everything with other metadata, like uh, you know, uh, domain and all those things. So again, user approval is required. You would use the same uh, authenticator that you used for registration. And if the, if the consent is received, the authenticator will surface uh, the credentials that is stored for that particular domain. Because in the registration flow, when the key pair was created, it is bound to the domain of that website, right? So it will, uh, it will, uh, it will surface the credentials for that particular domain, and you as a user can choose which credential you want. So if you have multiple credentials for the same website, it will list all of them. You can choose whichever you like. And once you do that, uh, the authenticator uses the private key uh, yeah. The authenticator uses the private key to sign the challenge that you receive from your server. And there is an additional step for sync pass key only if it is a new device that it you know, gets from your cloud. It gets the private key from your cloud so that you can use a new device. Uh, otherwise, it, it's not in the picture. So uh, private key is used to sign the challenge. Then an assertion uh, response gets created. Earlier, it was an attestation response because you're attesting, right? You're registering. 
Now what you are asserting, you're authenticating. So uh, it creates an assertion response, which has the signed challenge, not the, not the plain challenge. It has the, signed, the challenge that is signed using private key. It has client data and some other metadata. So all this is passed to your uh, client-side JavaScript, and your client-side uh, verifies the challenge. It makes sure the signed challenge matches the challenge that you issued because you have the public key. Now you can verify signatures, right? That is a signature verification mechanism that we are using here. So it verifies the challenge, and if it is signed by that private key, because if, we, if you are verifying using this public key, it, can, it could have only been signed by the private key associated with the public key, which means you can trust the user who trigger this entire flow, and you can authenticate that user. So this is how authentication works. Flow-wise, it's quite similar to how we would, use, we would use a password-based flow, but the difference is everything is being done using cryptographic key pairs instead of passwords. So, which means uh, we know how pass keys work now, right? Why, why, why do we need pass keys? How does it solve the issues that we saw with passwords? Let's go one by one. So password was knowledge-based, right? Whereas pass keys are discoverable credentials. They are not knowledge-based. They are something you have rather than something you know. In case of YubiKey, it is something you have, plus a second factor, because uh, pass keys also require you to, uh, when you are using something like YubiKey, it also requires you to have either a pin or a thumbprint or something, depending on the device, right? So you have multi-factor built in there already. Same goes for pl platform authenticators, right? Uh, you should have the device, and also you need to provide the secondary factor uh, using a thumbprint or your face or whatever, right? So it is multi-factor built in, right? So discoverable credentials, you don't even have to remember your usernames because most of the times the browser will list you all the usernames you have. If you only have one, then it just shows you that you just click on that. You don't have to remember anything unless you're like me who forgets the YubiKey all the time. I, I forget my YubiKey all the time. So another issue that we saw was phishing, right? Passkey is a phishing resistant because for phishing to work, someone has to use a domain that looks almost like the original one, right? But it's not the original one. For passkeys, if you use a domain which is not the one that you registered with, your browser will not even show you anything. Your, because your authenticator will not surface any credentials because the domain doesn't match with the credentials the authenticator has, which means your browser is not going to show you anything. That means you cannot do anything in a phishing website if you're using passkey. So no point trying to fish passkeys there. So it is phishing resistant. Similarly, uh, it is remote attack resistant because, again, something you have cannot be remotely breached, right? It's not something you know. Similarly, we are not uh, saving any sensitive info. So it is breach resistant when it comes to password. Of course, you are storing credit cards and stuff, still uh, attractive to, for breaching. But at least for passwords, it's breach resistant. It's no, nothing to steal, right? If you get public keys, public, right? Nothing to do with them. Similarly, because it is public-private key pairs, there is no reuse of a key pair. For every service you register, it is a unique uh, key pair being created, which is tied to the uh, domain of the service and to your user. Uh, similarly, not shareable. Uh, shareable, I have a star there, because uh, Apple went uh, and made it uh, airdroppable, which is, as per spec, it is not shareable, but Apple being Apple did it anyway. Uh, oh, it, it makes it slightly more uh, user-friendly, uh, 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 but yeah. Finally, password management, right? Uh, it's easier to maintain, especially sync passkeys. If your website is only allowing sync passkeys, you don't have to build any uh, recovery mechanism. You don't have to build any reset flows. You don't need multi-factor authentication flows. Um, you know, and if, if the user is going to use the platform, they don't even need password managers and stuff. So this, it makes things so much more easier. Right? But of course, if you are using device-bound passkeys, you still have to provide a recovery mechanism, because for device-bound passkeys, there is no uh, backup or recovery, so you have to provide some sort of recovery mechanism, but still easier to maintain. Let's see uh, uh, the usability and security of different uh, uh, security methods we have, right? So usability, this axis. So we have passwords, which is very convenient, but uh, you know, uh, the least secure. It's, it's good in usability. Then we have a password plus some sort of conditional multi-factor authentication. Again, uh, Slightly more secure because there is a conditional MFA at least, but slightly less uh, convenient because now you have MFA. You, 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 know, you have to go to your mobile phone or an email to get that whatever MFA things and uh, continue the flow. So it affects uh, the usability a little bit. Then we have password plus uh, SMS or email-based OTP, 
uh, second factor. Again, slightly more secure, but still not very convenient. The usability is, uh, again, quite less. Then we have uh, OAuth 2 based uh, social, social login. Uh, Security-wise, again, slightly better because you are relying on your OAuth 2 integration. Let's say if you are using uh, login with Google, you are relying on Google for the security, which assumptions or, or you know, which probably has better security than our own implementation. That is what we all assume. Uh, let's continue assuming that. So with that assumption, it is more secure and definitely uh, you know, high on usability, right? Because using social login is really easy. You don't have to do, you know, bother with your passwords and stuff. You just click on login with Google, you act, uh, give consent and done, right? So high uh, usability is quite high. Then we have sync pass keys, which is slightly better in usability because you, are, you, know, you, you don't have a lot of, you don't need to rely on another service, you just rely on your device. Um, especially if you're using a platform or uh, you know, a smartphone, you already have your authenticator built in, you know, so you don't have to carry them separately or you won't forget them. So it's highly usable and also much more secure because it relies on cryptography. Then we have a password plus Fido based platform authenticators, which is uh, as secure as sync pass keys, but slightly less convenient because you, know, you have to do that two steps. You have to authenticate, then you have to do a multi-factor thingy. But still, uh, it, it's, it's, it's much more convenient. And finally, we have device-bound passkeys, which is the golden standard for security. Um, but it is not as usable as sync passkeys because you, know, you have to carry around, let's say, your YubiKey, or you have to use your phone as the authenticator. So it affects usability a little bit. Uh, if you don't agree with the, you know, the usability ratings that I have, because I know, because that is very subjective, uh, you might think different, you can uh, go to this uh, Menti poll and you can mark your preferences or you can, you can rate them. And I'll uh, tweet the results at the end of the talk, or if I have some time, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the results and see if we agree. Last time I did this, almost agreed. Uh, doesn't mean everything is hunky-dory and doesn't mean uh, you know, uh, everything is great. There are challenges, of course. Uh, some of the challenges uh, has to do with the web author standard being a W3C standard. You know how this turns out, right? Browsers will end up implementing them slightly differently, so we already have slightly different uh, usability when it comes to Chrome and Firefox or Safari and so on. So it's going to have issues uh, with these compatibility issues between browsers, between uh, operating systems. Another issue is uh, privacy concerns over overlays on cloud vendors like Google or you know, Apple or Microsoft for saving your private keys and stuff. There is it's a valid concern. There are, uh, sorry, there are enterprise use cases like you know, uh, the stupid reset things that won't work here. And there are many other enterprise use cases that might not work with passkeys. For example, if your company doesn't allow, um, let's say, um, I iCloud access or Google uh, 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 Cloud access or whatever, right? then you won't be able to use sync passkeys with those mechanisms. So there are those kind of issues. And finally, for device-bound passkeys, we still have to uh, have some sort of recovery mechanism. You don't need reset per se, but some sort of recovery mechanism in case you know you lose uh, someone loses their uh, device, like the YubiKey, for example. So let's see uh, passkeys in action. So uh, I'll, I'll show a couple of uh, examples. I was going to li live code this, but yeah, I, I hardly have enough time for live coding this. So I'm just going to uh, show what I have. So uh, first one would be using an IDP, and of course I work for Auth0, so I'm going to use Auth0 as the IDP. Uh, if you want to try it out, uh, you can either uh, go to the GitHub repository and try it out, or you can basically, it's a few steps, it's, it's quite easy. You basically create a, a Spring Boot app using Spring, uh, uh, Spring Starter, uh, you add a controller for the basic mapping, you create an Auth0 app, you update your client ID, client secret, uh, you know, uh, on in the application properties, that's it. Right? So let's see. Okay, so I, uh, is it, uh, should I make it uh, bigger? Is it big enough? At the, at the back, is it okay? Cool. Okay, uh, where is my app? Okay, this is my app. Slightly bigger, okay. Uh, uh -huh. My VS code just 
hit somewhere. Ah, okay, I know where it is. This is difficult to do without a monitor. He told me it would be difficult. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have uh, this application. I have an application properties file with uh, my credentials, Spring uh, Boot Pro tip. If you put an application properties file on the root of the project, it works almost like a .n file. Spring Boot will read from that, and you can override uh, things in your actual application properties. So ideal place to put uh, secrets and stuff like that, and then just add this application properties to git ignore. So. It almost works like dot n, so you don't have to use an additional library to work with dot n and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, so this is the only things you would do. So um, you you create uh, you create a controller with the uh, uh, path. You add uh, you create an auth zero application, uh, which would be a web uh, application on auth zero. You add your credentials there, and let me start this up. Okay, so I'm going to uh, sign up and create a passkey. Huh. Yeah, I need to provide an email, so let's see, test.test.com. Uh, I haven't set up any email validation on this tenant, so it's fine. So this time I'm going to use my phone uh, to create the passkey. So I'm going to click create passkey. So it's going to, my phone is already linked because I'm signed in uh, with uh, you know, Google on both accounts, so it's already linked. So I can use my phone, or if you know, if you want to link something new, this is how you do it. You just scan it, and your phone gets linked, and you can use that. But I already have it linked, so I'm just going to use my phone here. Continue. So I'm going to get, uh, yeah, it's hard to see, I know. And I'm going to get a notification here to create a new passkey. Uh, so you can choose whatever provider. For example, I chose my phone's own password manager. Uh, to save it, or you could choose Google or you know Apple's thingy, whatever. Uh, okay, I waited too long, so you have to do it quite immediately. Okay, continue. Uh, I'm going to create a passkey, authenticate with my fingerprint, and it received the passkey. I give uh, my OAuth to consent. Accept. Yes. So I'm logged in, right? So if I if I log out now. And if I say continue with the passkey, so this is the browser showing me all the passwords, uh, all the passkeys that are saved for that particular domain. Because I know I, I've been doing this for a while, so I have a lot of things saved here. So let's try to uh, find uh, where is the one that I just created. Uh, 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 uh. I'm pretty sure I did something wrong here. I'm just going to. So I got connected. Yeah, it's, it, I, did, I think it didn't sync fast enough. So I got my test thingy here, the test account that I just created, and voila, I got logged in, right? So I can also do it with uh, uh, YubiKeys, for example. So I have uh, another, another demo for that. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to close this. I'm going to also forward. Now I'm going to keep this. Um, yeah. So I have another application already built. Uh, let me show you the how to access it. 
So that was that app. So for pass keys in Java application, right, we have two options. We have a library called WebAuthn4j, uh, which is uh, Fido conformant and supports all attestation formats. You can, I uh, know, it has uh, Spring security support, Kotlin support. It is the one that is being used in Keyclock. So we have this library. We also have uh, Java Web Authn server from Ubico, uh, which is not 100% Fido conformant, but still can get the job done. So we have these two libraries in the Spring world if you want to implement uh, this on your own without using an IDP, right? Like how you would uh, roll your own password-based solution. So you can do that using any of these libraries. So uh, the example that I have is done with uh, Web Authn 4J. So you can uh, get it from uh, GitHub if you want to look around how it is implemented. Um, so this one. Again, uh, let me show a quick demo of this. I'm going to start this. Uh, I don't have the time to show, get into the code there, but yeah, you can go into the GitHub repository and check. It's quite simple. The, you only need to look at the security configuration file and uh, the uh, uh, default controller there is. These are the only things that matters. And let's go here. Uh, it's going to run on localhost. So this is my own implementation, like a very simple uh, thingy. So I'm going to register uh, using a I'm going to register using a UB key now. So register a new pass key. So I have this uh, I have this UB key with a, a fingerprint sensor. So I'm going to use that. So I'm going to uh, say I'm going to touch. It's going to so it is registered successfully. Now I can sign in with the same. Uh, so now it, it shows something I already created on that particular YubiKey. Uh, but I can just touch on the YubiKey, and it automatically recognizes that, and it signs me in. So if you have multiple, you will just choose one if you want, and then touch. But regardless, it, so this is all the discoverable part. The browser does most of the things for you. You don't have to worry about uh, a lot of things yourself. So that's uh, how you do in uh, uh, Spring Security, right? But how to do it with Spring Security natively, right? Good news is that uh, passkey support is coming natively to Spring Security. So there is a project called Spring uh, Security Web Authn, which is being worked by Rob Winch. So currently it is in experimental state, but it, is, uh, it will provide a default registration and login pages for you. It will become a Spring Security core option, hopefully. Uh, it, is, it is also based on WebAuthn 4J, uh, uh, but you don't have to use a separate library uh, when this becomes uh, uh, integrated. It will be part of core uh, Spring Security. Uh, expected, hopefully, in Spring Security 6.4 in November, hopefully. Um, work is uh, going on there. If you want to try out, go to the spring-security-webauthn uh, repo on GitHub. Try it out uh, and provide feedback. Uh, so that th this gets merged fast, and we can have it natively in Spring Security, and you know, use it like every other Spring features with joy. Okay. So, uh, is it my left time? Oh, I still have seven minutes left. I thought my talk was over at 12:20. Huh, apparently, I have still. Okay, because of the time at the beginning. Okay. Uh, good because I can take questions now. Damn it. I was hoping to finish just on time so I can just escape, you know. Damn it, they tricked me. Anyway, if you want to learn more, uh, learnpasskeys.io is an excellent uh, resource. You, will, you can see step by step how it works with uh, all the code uh, and all the data that is being transferred, so you can see in depth what is happening in real time. Uh, other resources which could be useful, WebAuthn, if you want to learn more about WebAuthn, because WebAuthn is not just about passkeys, right? WebAuthn is also used for multi-factor authentication, which is very similar to how passkeys work, but also slightly different, because multi-factor authentication is on the server side, passkeys are on the client side. So resources, uh, we have a passkeys challenge at, uh, at the Auth0 booth if you're interested. Uh, we have some nice GIFs if you want to scan this or just come to our booth. You can do it, uh, you need a laptop for this. And uh, use Auth0, because they pay me. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, I'll take questions on that corner, there. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.